Hello everyone and welcome back to Nordvik. This is episode 2 and if you haven't watched episode 1 already then I highly recommend that you do so. But if you haven't then I can give you a quick recap of what we have done. In the last one we um, sort of gave a huge introduction to the series as we built the... Um, didn't necessarily build the map but we did build a lot of uh, networks built up a lot of road infrastructure but uh, most importantly we did uh, talk a lot about the series and gave a lot of information so by all means go ahead and watch that and some of you might actually be watching this maybe right after episode 1 goes live this episode is available right after I upload episode 1 uh, through my discord so hello to you if you are here early on Right now I don't know how long uh, this video will stay unlisted, uh, meaning that it won't be public, but it will be public for a few, uh, might be a few weeks, might be a whole month, I don't know, we'll see. It all depends on how I'm doing with my third episode, because uh, I have already built that, but I haven't really started editing or started, um, started doing any sort of voiceover or anything, so... Uh, I just started editing this one, so why should I think about the next one? But what we are doing today is we're actually starting to build something. Uh, the roads, they are here, at least the main roads. Uh, so we want to start off, you know, building uh, more on the map. The first thing that we are building is this uh, sort of a um, hotel, rest stop, gas station area. Um, it is inspired by a place in real life in Norway. I've driven past it probably a hundred times. But it's a really cool uh, hotel that is situated across the uh, highway. So you actually, when you're driving on the highway, you drive underneath the hotel, uh, which is sort of cool. And then you have a, uh, actually have two gas stations on each side as well. Now I talked about uh, this main road in the last episode. This main road is inspired by the Norwegian road E6, which is the main road in Norway, uh, going from, uh, well, it enters the country all the way south, southeast from Sweden, and then it goes all the way up, and I think it actually ends up in Norway. I don't think it goes all over to Russia or anything. I think it ends all the way up north. So when I started building, um, started preparing to build for episode 2 I was wondering if what could I do uh, now that I already had the highway ready I had the like my version of E6 ready now what would do what do I want to do with it um, the first thing that popped into my mind was this hotel uh, it is a, a hotel right north of Trondheim which is called Stav Hotel it is mostly a hotel meant for people driving really uh, I've never heard about someone who took a, a weekend there it's more for people um, who are driving long distances and need to stop uh, there is also a um, rest stop for trucks uh, nearby but I think you know they'd rather want to, to uh, sleep in the hotel than their own uh, in their own trucks so this isn't really a fancy hotel or anything I never been to the hotel myself I have driven underneath it, which sounds a little bit weird, but um, I, I've never been there, but I assume it's just meant for, you know, people on the go, people who are driving um, long distances, you know, the, the, the one thing that pops into mind is truckers, because they, um, I think they have to stop every eight hours and get a certain amount of sleep, um, they're actually, they have to stop legally, it's not, you know, they should stop the truck itself is being monitored so whenever it is moving a timer goes really and then the um, I think the company that owns the truck or something uh, they get notified whenever a truck has been moving for longer than uh, than eight hours in one go don't quote me on anything like that but um, it's it's very strict because the driving heavy machinery you know accidents happen and when when a normal car hits a, a truck, you know, it's bound to end up ugly. And you do see, um, this is actually more like a 
international thing and not just a purely Scandinavian thing but uh, rest stops are quite a big thing they're usually not just a empty parking lot they sometimes have a, uh, a bathroom they sometimes have even a store or in this case they have a hotel a gas station car wash you know whatever I think the reason why it's so many rest stops in Norway is because there is quite a huge distance between settlements, you know, between towns and cities. Not so much further south, south uh, east, but if you go to uh, further north and uh, west as well, it's not just a huge distance between cities, but also a huge distance between any sort of, um, of settlement. And so I wanted to sort of replicate the same thing in uh, Norvik by placing this um, hotel rest stop thing. <laughs> uh, I wanted to place it quite far away from the main city. If you remember the map I showed you last time, uh, this is actually quite a far away away from it, further north or probably further west, northwest probably. So this hotel would um, mainly house truckers probably or people who are driving from one city to another and uh, they need to stop for a while that might just be stop for some gas or stop for a car wash or a quick snack or actually just stop for a night in a somewhat comfortable bed this hotel right here is um, is a lot bigger than the one in real life so I would assume it is a lot more established and a lot more popular as well um, it could also be like a um, conference center in here, so uh, so maybe businesses could um, could rent rooms here to you know have meetings or to have like team building exercises or whatnot. Uh, you do see a lot of those because it is uh, this hotel is quite good and it's quite huge. Talking about the asset, it is not a hotel. It is uh, specially made for Columbia City which is a series by press and it actually is a pier uh, and I think it might be a replicate from a pier in Seattle or at least looks very much like a pier uh, from uh, from Seattle but the reason why I took it is because it kind of looked um, kind of looks like a hotel really and it also is very long not so wide and uh, not so tall either. I think there are like three stories here. I might be wrong because most hotels on the workshop they are. It's more common that they are big when it comes to height instead of length. And I uh, I did especially want the other way around. So um, I think yeah, when I first found this asset, it was just a few days after it was uploaded. So I was actually quite lucky with uh, finding that one. Uh, at that time you know so I guess it was the right place at the right time I did however use procedural object or procedural objects I think it's called uh, for the first time in years I used it on the uh, hotel itself and also on one of the gas stations um, just to make them bigger um, the hotel was it wasn't quite as long as I would like um, and I I'm sorry if you're looking at uh, the time lapse and look how I'm dealing with um, PO and you, yeah, you you want to jump off a cliff I understand that but it's me trying out stuff and uh, I, I first wanted it just to be longer but I didn't know how to do that so I just actually just made it bigger itself um, just bumped up the size in, in all angles and honestly it uh, it does work and I'm really happy with how it turned out and the reason why I use procedural, it's a tough word to say that, procedural objects on the gas station is because um, I wanted the gas station to be um, the same um, same brand, really, uh, just like it is in real life. It is two shell stations on each side. And there's not that many gas stations on the workshop, not that many shell stations at least. So I used just the same one and to make it look uh, a little less copy paste i decided to just bump up the size on uh, on one of them so it looked um, it looked a little bit more unique on the other side i also spent a lot of time with 
poppable asphalt to create sort of a nice uh, entrance to the hotel. Uh, there's an entrance on both sides and there's also a, a nice walkway um, for for people on one side of the uh, hotel and there is actually a road on the other side which actually is uh, operational so people can actually drive over it. Also spent some time on building a, a parking lot on both sides and also a um, very small truck parking spot um, behind one of the gas stations. Uh, should probably have been bigger but um, I, was, I was so happy with how it looked size wise. Um, the whole footprint of this um, of this uh, rest stop area. So I didn't want to try to do anything else. I didn't want to expand it in any other way. So I'm actually happy with how it turned out. Even though I can just probably fit three or four uh, trucks in that area, but uh, I guess um, I guess they can find a spot if they really want to. Vegetation is also very important around this area. I did spend a lot of time to make it look sort of like cut out uh, out of the wilderness uh, because it is a dense forest around here it is uh, situated on top of a valley which sounds a bit weird weird but there's actually two two mountains on each uh, on each side and this valley this is the highest point of it so when you are in the hotel you can actually get a pretty nice view uh, on both sides and I didn't want to lose that feeling that you know this was sort of in the middle of nowhere, so I um, spent a lot of time on uh, bushes and grass around this area to make it really look, uh, yeah, kind of uh, like it's disappearing into the f into the uh, wilderness, into the forest, because when they built this rest stop, um, probably for many years after it, it was quite visible that you know there has been people working here and changing up the landscape but now a few years have passed probably like decades has passed i'm i'm thinking this hotel is quite old and it's actually quite noticeable that um, nature is sort of blending in again and it looks more uh, it looks more natural which is uh, quite good and what i was aiming for because even though you're making highways in the middle of nowhere you know highways is a very big change into the landscape made by humans but um, you want to sort of make it look as natural as possible and even when they're making new roads right now um, it is um, it is quite important that they make it look pretty natural that's why they're adding a lot of uh, trees and grass the moment they are building roads to make it look you know a little less like a parking lot really and more like a, um, a simple road going through uh, going through the uh, landscape now that we are done with the um, hotel slash gas station slash rest stop we are working on this uh, small church and graveyard in most cases in almost every case the uh, church has always been sort of like the the center for each and every village or city. It's almost like the bigger the church, the uh, the bigger of the community surrounding it. Of course, now these days, Christianity and the church itself isn't that um, important part of the society. But I would still say that Norway is uh, quite religious still, but there. Uh, maybe going to church has become sort of more of a tradition like myself i am still um, baptized and uh, gone through my confirmation at uh, age 15 but i didn't really do anything of that because i was personal christian but uh, because it's sort of a tradition and it's sort of a at least the confirmation is uh, it's more of a coming of age and um, yeah it's, it's just you, you just follow what everyone else is doing and uh, everyone else was doing the same thing so uh, I am actually registered still in the uh, Church of Norway which is a, um, a Lutheran church Lutheran is a part of the Protestant part of, uh, of the church or, or of Christianity and it is uh, by far the largest um, church in, uh, in Norway 
I think yeah, seventy percent of uh, all Norwegians are uh, are somewhat a part of that church, whether they um, are active or whether they just got baptized. And once you get baptized, you're actually registered for life. You have to call them and you know ask them to take out your name. Um, but it really doesn't affect you in any way. Um, it doesn't affect me at all, really. Uh, this church that we're building uh, is actually quite uh, spot on when it comes to what a typical Norwegian church looks like. I think the asset itself is a uh, an American one. It looks like, like a Midwestern church. Uh, the reason why I took it is because it is wooden, which is um, like the only kind of church you'll find. The churches that aren't wooden in Norway they are most likely qualified as cathedrals and they are uh, very often more situated inside a city center but once you get further out uh, further to the uh, further on the countryside like this this is typical this is actually actually exactly what you might expect to find now building a church isn't really um, uniquely scandinavian but uh, what we're building after this one is um, a lot more unique. Um, in Norwegian we call it a Ptestegård, which uh, directly translated means uh, means priest farm, but if you are English or American you probably would call it a manse. I never heard the word uh, manse before, but uh, a manse is a clergy house uh, which um, a minister or uh, any sort of priest uh, lives in. It's not just that he lives in it, but you know he he works from there as well. But what is um, different in the uh, Scandinavian version is that it's most likely always a farm instead of just a uh, just a house. Back then, everyone had to do some sort of farming. Uh, let's see, it's the only way that they got food. So that also m means that um, priests had to. Uh, had to also do a little bit of farming. The farm usually, almost all the time, is uh, right next to the church and is usually uh, called uh, Ptestegård in uh, in every place. Or or in English it would be Mans, of course. The only thing that would uh, be different is uh, the um, location itself before the word Mans or Ptestegård. So if this place was called Nordvik, this exact place, they would be called, you know, Nordvik Plastigoid, um, Nordvik Mans. Now in these days, um, these aren't usually uh, in use anymore. Um, the house is, and, and I do believe very often the farm is as well, but uh, the priest usually doesn't uh, juggle both uh, occupations. It's either one way or another. But what they often do is they rent out the uh, the farm and the uh, the land that they own as well, because they just don't own the uh, own the farm itself. They also also land the land uh, nearby, because being a priest these days or a bishop or whatever, um, a lot more of a full time job. The same with a farmer actually. I will go in detail on uh, typical Norwegian farmhouses. Uh, very shortly, but what I can say about the uh, mans is that they were always quite nice. They were always quite big. Uh, they would have huge, nice trees surrounding them uh, because, you know, back in the day, back in the day, sounds like it was just when I was young, but I mean, hundreds of years ago, being a priest literally meant that you were almost in charge, really. It's kind of like... Um, like being a mayor as well, you have the responsible, you have the responsibility uh, when it comes to religion, but you also had a lot of other um, responsibilities when it comes to 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 leading and administrating a uh, a society. So these manses they were often quite huge, quite nice, well kept. Of course, it was a, a sign of prosperity, really, and. Uh, yeah, priests and bishops, they were um, they were living the good life. 
they were the probably the only ones who were above them in a society were probably royals, I would assume. Now we are done working on the uh, on the church and the uh, manse right across the road. Now we're working on some farmlands. We're gonna be working on that for for a while now because um, I did spend a lot of time working on it and it is uh, a lot to talk about. Farming has always been number one priority in uh, in Norway at least. I think it was until um, maybe the last 50-60 years that farming wasn't the um, main industry in the country. You know, we uh, in Norway they found uh, oil in the 60s I think and a lot of people started working in the oil business and you know the last 10 20 years IT uh, has become larger and larger and um, farming just gets smaller and smaller the farms are usually very old I don't think I ever heard about someone who built a farm because there is um, it's just so many farms and so little farmers so a lot of them are probably ready to be moved into at any time. Quite often a farm would have gone in uh, in generations, probably several generations, hundreds of years. And a uh, long time ago, living on a farm or um, owning a farm was a sign of uh, wealth and power. Uh, you probably weren't all the way up there alongside with the uh, priest but um, you had land and that really meant that you were powerful this isn't just in Norway this was probably all over Europe and all over the world when you owned land you did have power and you did have meaning almost one example of that is uh, when they in 1814 um, in Norway they wrote the constitution after ending the union with Denmark and those who wrote it um, they were just men of course it was just men it was in 1814 what do you think but they uh, they also were farmers uh, they were owners of huge farms meaning they had power political power as well those who didn't own a farm very often rented uh, smaller houses, uh, smaller farms within the farm's property. Often these um, these small buildings, they were um, almost hidden away uh, on the edges of the property. And those who lived there, they, um, they worked for the owner of the farm. And they had different kinds of uh, agreements, but uh, often they would either work Worked directly with him uh, by doing you know tasks on the on the main part of the f farm, or they had their own plot of farm within the farm that they uh, sort of rented, the food um, that they produced or the milk that they produced. The farm owner would get would have gotten probably the majority of it, but uh, those the thing that was left, the bare necessities was given to. Uh, to those uh, farmers who were rented and lived on these uh, small homes on the edge of the property. And these kinds of homes in uh, Norwegian is called uh, husmansplass and a lot of people uh, lived in those. I definitely think there was a lot more people living in these kinds of places than on the um, proper big farms. So people either lived in uh, farms, farm, farm homes, or they lived in this uh, Husmans Plus, which I was talking about. Or they lived in the city. What is so great about uh, building farms or these kinds of farms in city skylines is because most of them look exactly the same. There's not that much, uh, they're not too unique. And what's quite cool is that they are literally the same all across the country. And I've also been to Sweden and I've seen the same sort of um, farms as well. It is basically one way they were building it and uh, they all look uh, sort of the same. 
The farm itself is um, quite basic, it is um, quite tall and 99% of all times it is painted red. You know, this is where they would have cattle or goats or this is where they would store their grain, barley, you know, whatever. But what is more interesting is the house itself. The inspiration I took is uh, sort of the traditional sorts of farmhouses in Trøndelag, in Norway. Trøndelag is a county in Norway. There are, um, there used to be, uh, I think, with 19 counties, but they they sort of uh, merged so many together to create fewer ones. But uh, anyways, Trøndelag is situated right in the middle of Norway. It's uh, sort of right before it gets quite narrow and the homes they are called Trønde Lån. The last part of that word uh, Lån is actually a Norse word and it means uh, long or um, stretch or um, or a row. They also have the word in uh, on the Faroe Islands it, there they call it Lån and that means long building and that's actually just what it is it's a long building and uh, the first part of the name Trundet is just meaning that uh, it is from or in the county of uh, Trundelag. This is traditionally speaking the uh, main house on uh, large farms or somewhat large farms in this county and nearby counties as well. It is long, it can be as long as 40 meters in some cases and it's quite narrow usually not more than five or six meters and also um, most of the time it's uh, two stories now the reason why it is so big is because um, historically speaking this was um, not just a home to one family but also several generations you know you have the uh, sons and daughters you have the parents you have the grandparents and maybe sometimes even their great grandparents there is actually a uh, quite popular and uh, traditional uh, fairy tale in Norway called uh, in Norwegian Seven of Fire which is directly translated to uh, the seventh father of the house. And it is um, a story about this man who uh, comes to visit a, um, a building like this, actually, like this farm, and he wants to stay over the night. He has to ask for permission and then he has to ask for permission from the father of the house and then everyone he meets uh, always says the same thing that uh, don't ask me go ask my father and eventually he like meets someone who's 200 years old i think he actually lives in a uh, french horn that is uh, hanging from the uh, hanging from the wall i think the fairy tale ends with uh, the oldest father the one in the horn uh, says that he can live here or can stay the night and they, they throw a big feast or something I don't know, but um, that's uh, that's sort of an example of um, You know how it was almost I don't think there were seven generations in one building, but uh, Definitely back in the day and they had uh, at least three generations More often than not these days on the other hand uh, You rarely find that actually uh, m most of the cases the uh, grandparents, they usually move out uh, from these sort of farms to maybe a smaller house or maybe even an apartment in the city. Because a hundred years ago, and um, even more, you know, there were no such thing as being retired. Uh, there was no such thing as getting um, those uh, retirement money or, you know, the one thing that you save up. There, there were no such thing as that, you know, once you couldn't work, you were you were reliant on uh, others. And that's why they live together, um, children and uh, grandchildren, is uh, because they, um, you know, needed someone to take care of them, really, because uh, there were no nurses who were going from farm to farm, you just had to do it yourself. Now, as society has progressed, old people don't really have to rely on their children and their grandchildren to take care of them anymore. They can either live in a retirement home or they can live at home um, in their own house, but they can get uh, someone 
a nurse coming in every like once a week or something to just to check up on them and make sure that they're doing all right usually now all people feel that they don't want to get in the way uh, for the children so they they really rather not wanting to you know share their problems and feel like a burden because um, you know when you're old you're in your 80s and 90s you probably can't drive anymore you struggle just to stand upright you feel like a burden and you feel like I uh, I don't think you feel too good so then you don't want to you don't want to be in your children's way so that's why a lot more people now live in these retirement homes uh, this isn't just in Norway this is I think yeah all over the uh, developed world but at least uh, 100 years ago 200 years ago this was very common and uh, probably the only way they would um, survive at an old age living in these uh, houses alongside with uh, younger generations also one of these farms I built actually two houses um, two homes which is another thing that you uh, might see a lot and uh, that is actually uh, the house for the oldest uh, the grandparents the great grandparents uh, they live in the smaller ones so they have moved out they don't want to be in their children's uh, you know way they don't want to be uh, you know screwing up for them so instead of moving to another house anywhere or to an apartment in the nearby town they instead build a smaller uh, house right there right on the property and this is actually something my grandparents have done uh, this this year uh, they realized that uh, they're getting too old to take care of the house itself uh, because um, you know there are two stories the stairway is quite steep I, I, I struggle walking up and down that stairway now I'm, I'm in my 20s so they want to make it easy on themselves so they built uh, a smaller home right there right next to the um, to the bigger home to the bigger house and they already had um, rented out the farm and the farm farmlands that they owned for several years to this one guy and he actually is now moving into the main farmhouse and he's sort of sort of becoming like the main farmer there even though he's still renting everything he's renting the uh, home he's renting the uh, farm like the barn and he's also renting the land around it so that was my history lesson for you I um, hope you learned something this is quite fun quite fun to build this actually because you know I I didn't grew up on a farm but I spent so much time um, for example with my grandparents or at a friend's house who lived on a farm so building this and also talking about it you know sharing facts and stories from it um, it's, it's quite fun, it's quite unique. I, I, I couldn't have done this uh, Boulder Cove, for example, because it is set in uh, sort of the northwestern Pacific part of the US and Canada. However, this is um, literally where I grew up almost. So that's why I'm probably ranting a little bit too much about the history and the, uh, the cultural aspect of just say, a simple farm. But, uh, but hopefully you learn something. I did also place out uh, other houses in this area, um, another farm, but also two other normal looking simple houses. And I also actually placed down a uh, cow spawner. So and actually, um, and, and what's, what's really nice about them is actually they're moving, they're not props or anything. So we actually have some, uh, we have some movement on these uh, fields, which is uh, just, just lovely. Now, as I said in the earlier episode, I don't have a collection up and running. I don't know if I actually mentioned it, but um, I don't have a collection right now. I am uh, hoping to get one up and running quite soon. I still need to um, sort of add some final touches. But if you do see something in this episode and you're wondering what kind of asset is that, what kind of prop, mod or whatever, just just ask uh, and i'll uh, i'll try my best to help you out 
because I'm using a special set of uh, decals, for example, to create these uh, farmlands. I'm using a special set of trees and bushes to create the um, create the forest around this area. So there's a lot, and um, if you are wondering, as I said, then just please let me know in the comments below, and I'll try my best to um, to help you out. Now we have been working on uh, farms and farmlands for a while. It is uh, time to start working on some houses. What I'm building now is a housing estate. It's uh, quite a nice one actually. It, uh, it's got a wonderful view over the uh, fjord. And it is uh, quite close to the uh, highway. So it's not that far away from the city as well, so it would be a nice place to live. But um, yeah, as I said, this is a housing estate. Um, these houses didn't pop up organically. Uh, with housing estates, it's usually uh, the uh, city council that um, have sort of bought up the land from a local landowner uh, and said uh, we're gonna make um, properties for sale there or other cases a company has gone in and bought uh, the land and uh, split, split it up to uh, to make to uh, to make sort of uh, smaller properties but although uh, usually you'll find that there are um, companies creating housing estates you usually find that more in a city or nearby you know that's usually where people live um, a lot of more people so they usually tend to uh, to buy near, near a city and they usually tend to create um, more apartments really instead of uh, single houses like you you'll find here now I uh, as I was building this one I was sort of um, making a backstory to this uh, housing estate and I was thinking about um, probably what the name could be because this is situated right next to the church so I would assume that the uh, land that the city bought to uh, to create or to to sell on these properties these individual properties they would buy it from the um, maybe the priest or maybe even the church itself because near where I grew up uh, we had sort of the sort of the same thing that uh, a housing estate uh, was being built near uh, the uh, local church and the name for that housing estate uh, is sort of a mix between the Norwegian word for manse which I talked about earlier and also the Norwegian word for housing estate so um, Norwegian word for manse as I already mentioned is prestegård and the Norwegian word for housing estate is boligfelt now bolig means house and felt means estate uh, it's not quite directly translated but that's what it means so mixing these two words together and you probably would get a nice name for this housing estate and that is Prestegoys Felte so the man's estate if you if you will that's the name at least for the uh, housing estate near the church where I grew up I didn't grow up in the housing estate but nearby and I know that um, there are several places in Norway uh, that have the same name like several housing estates that share the exact same name Because simply why wouldn't you call it that because it's 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 actually what it is So why would you call it anything else? The housing estate itself is um, it's not that big. It's quite small. It's uh, one way in one way out so it's um, It's a dead end You'll often find these uh, homeowner associations I know a lot of countries have them, and they're quite um, common in other countries. Um, they're also quite common um, in Norway as li at least. So I would assume that this whole housing estate would be a, uh, a association, a homeowner association. So they would together try to keep it um, you know, nice for everyone to live there. 
maybe they uh, they clean up the streets like once or twice a year uh, usually right after the snow has melted that's usually when these guys go out and, and clean up uh, because there are there won't be anyone else to do it maybe also the uh, road that uh, the uh, housing estate is on is actually owned by the uh, homeowner association so if they want the road to be repaired or they want to in the uh, winter they want to um, to keep snow away from the road and to, uh, to do a little bit of shoveling they have to do it themselves but in Norway at least most roads are being uh, plowed by a plow truck owned by the uh, owned by the city unless it is quite a small road and it's owned by private people really I also included a uh, playground here which I also would assume the homeowner association would be responsible of maybe they um, they bought up that one property and instead of building a house there they just simply made it to a playground you know sometimes a homeowner association is quite a pain in the butt if you know what I mean but other times they're actually quite uh, quite handy and they can uh, can do a lot of good it's sort of a nice way to create a um, community within a community if you know what I mean if you live in a uh, small town for example you usually uh, will have a, a homeowner association for the uh, small part that you live in I'm once again referring to my childhood but uh, where we grew up um, it was quite rural but we had a few we had a few neighbors and um, we had a homeowner association uh, with these guys and we would usually um, you know do s different kinds of things really during the uh, during the year we will also build different kinds of stuff but um, like the things that we did I remember um, we usually had a because uh, we built a volleyball court in, uh, in, in someone's yard really uh, and um, we also had like these tournaments that we uh, that we took a part in and also I think uh, once a year there was a um, football tournament between all homeowner associations uh, within the uh, the small rural community that I grew up in the uh, the small village so we would meet at the uh, at the local school uh, they had a um, a nice um, pitch in the back which was uh, home for home to the local sports club and there was let's say a simple tournament you know between uh, I think probably up towards like 15 to 20 different homeowner associations so it is really a nice way to uh, to as I said you know create a small community within a community <laughs> you know as humans we are social creatures and we'll always find uh, find ways to uh, create new social bonds wherever we live I am quite curious though if you uh, if you live uh, anywhere else than uh, Norway or uh, Scandinavia is this sort of a common thing as well is this um, is this a thing you heard about is this sort of something that you experienced and even within Norway and within Scandinavia is have you also been a part of something like this I'm uh, curious to know because uh, this might actually be a very local thing I don't know but uh, we'll see what I do also want to know is uh, if you're still watching because if you have you have been watching for a really long time I am um, not too sure when uh, or how long this video is gonna end up I am probably thinking I think we're gonna go over an hour which uh, is just perfect in my opinion so also let me know if you actually watched the entire thing and if you're hearing the words that I'm saying right now I would be uh, very happy to know who you are and if you have watched the whole thing through then um, you have to press like I mean you don't have a choice you watch an hour you have to press like it's uh, that's the toll you're not gonna get uh, you're not gonna leave unless you press like and if you want to see more if you want to see episode 3 where we continue working with even more farmland but also we're gonna work a lot more on uh, nature 
we're gonna build a uh, nice a nice lake I would call it and a, a nice river flowing through a beautiful landscape with uh, actually several dams along that river it's y you'll know you'll know if you want to see screenshots of that they will be up soon on Twitter and on Discord just to you know sort of tease you a little bit but I am really happy with what we built in this far we got the hotel slash rest stop we got um, this entire area here all the way done really with the church and the manse and the, uh, the farms and the uh, housing estate we did it all and I'm really happy how it turned out uh, once again as I said in the last episode I'm not too happy with the houses that I have because there's not that many to choose from when it comes to simple one to two stories tall houses made out of wood it's not that many so uh, this housing estate could been done a little bit better but uh, I hope uh, I hope I'll eventually uh, stumble across something on the workshop that uh, suits my needs if you are interested in making houses for example but uh, anything for this series it could be uh, any kind of um, stuff that you usually find on the workshop from a car to a house to a flag to a sign whatever then uh, don't be shy uh, head on over to my discord and we'll be in touch there I'll, I'll literally say yes to almost anything really as long as it is um, helping with the immersion to make this look really realistic I want it to be extremely realistic and uh, so far so good happy with how it's turning out now now we're done now is the end we're gonna show some um, you're gonna see some cinematics right now I um, would once again say press like if you watch the entire thing subscribe for even more next episode will be up whenever it is ready so um, <laughs> I don't know when that is gonna be hopefully sooner rather than later but um, who knows okay that's it I'd like to thank you all for watching hope to see you soon and bye for now